Okay, hi there, welcome to a video looking at the idea behind the environmental Kuznets curve. Now, the environmental Kuznets curve, or EKC, uh, shows that initially the pollution and environmental damage uh, surpasses the level of income per capita as countries uh, start to develop. However, the trend might reverse. It might be possible to decouple the impact of growth on the environment uh, because economic growth can lead to environmental upgrading and, and a, an eventual fall in per capita emissions per dollar or per pound of national output. So we put the index of pollution, classic example might be CO2 emissions per dollar of GDP, or perhaps sulfur dioxide emissions, but some sort of index of pollution or environmental degradation on the y-axis and on the x-axis, a measure of income per capita perhaps adjusted for uh, inflation and PPP. Now, the idea is that uh, there is this kind of relationship, non-linear relationship between pollution, emissions per capita, or, or per unit of GDP, and, and wealth. Initially, as a country is growing and developing, they're on a fairly steep trajectory, and it could well be the case that an, income in, an increase in income per capita leads to a substantial rise in emissions uh, associated with heavy industries, for example. So that's the upward sloping bit of the Kuznets curve, and implying a trade-off here between growth and environmental degradation. So why might growth lead to a rapid increase, a substantial increase in emissions? Lots of potential reasons. Let me highlight a few for you. Oftentimes, this, this phase of structural change in an economy involves rapid, fast pace of industrialization, and heavy industries such as steel and, and mining and extraction, for example, are often quite energy intensive. There could be increasing emissions also from the process of urbanization within countries. And typically countries on lower middle incomes, they tend to have, not always, but they tend to have relatively weak institutions, which might be shown through, for example, in weak environmental laws, absence of compliance, and also perhaps slightly lax uh, pollution regulations. Many low-income countries also may have access, limited access to, to the most up-to-date technology and infrastructure which can help to mitigate the impact in emissions. And their sources of energy typically, not always, but typically are heavily reliant on dirtier fuels uh, such as coal. So uh, that first phase, we see a rise in emissions per capita. However, what we might see in the second phase of the Kuznets curve is a shift of an economy for example, from a more carbon-intensive heavy manufacturing to less polluting, less carbon-intensive service quaternary-based industries. Uh, so it may well be the case that as a result of this, let's say we start off at Y3 and a high level of pollution emissions per unit of GDP at E3, it may be the case that actually if we can increase output to Y4, we can move down the Kuznets curve. An improvement in environmental uh, position even though a country is getting richer. In evaluation, uh, service-focused economies, the UK is one, for example, 80% of our GDP tends to go on services. United States, Germany, uh, those service-focused countries tend to create indirect emissions by outsourcing manufacturing of trainers, genes, etc., to countries with lower labour costs where there may well be a higher emissions per capita or per unit of GDP. So how can we decouple? How can we break the link between economic growth showing through in per capita incomes and environmental degradation? Well, there are lots of reasons to be optimistic on the Kuznets curve. First of all, innovation can lead to the emergence of, critically, the scaled application of cleaner production techniques. Um, clean coal Technology, for example, might be a good example. So countries may well be able to make a transition towards low carbon economies. Uh, governments oftentimes put in place much stringent, tougher um, environmental laws. Could be emission zones, clean air acts, uh, and also greater consumer awareness of the impact of uh, consumption and production. And of course, there could well be one or more multiple interventions in markets, such as carbon taxes, um, clean fuel subsidies, and uh, maybe a carbon trading system. 
Typically, as countries get richer, as they develop, there's a structural change away from heavy industry towards services, which, uh, which generally speaking, may be less carbon and, and energy and emissions intensive. Uh, and that to add to that, the emergence of policies and capabilities to promote, for example, smart urbanization to bring down emissions per dollar of GDP in, in cities. Some cities do that better than others. Essentially, the story here is that as incomes go up, people, businesses, communities might well be prepared to pay slightly higher prices in return for stronger environmental standards built into the cost of goods and services. In this sense, the income elasticity of demand for aspects of, of cleaner fuel and lower emissions per capita might be quite high. A really good example of that is solar energy. The cost of solar energy has collapsed in many countries, particularly because of the exploitation of economies of scale. And the growth of solar energy, I think, really does raise the prospects of clean technology uh, as more countries achieve those economies of scale in, in renewable energy generation. Certainly in the UK, there is quite strong evidence of a decoupling effect. Over a 30-year period, GDP per head grew by over two-thirds, by over 70%. At the same time, CO2 emissions fell by 34%. That is a decoupling, that's a breaking of the link. Clearly more to do, and it has to happen across countries. Uh, but to the ONS here saying this is a result of structural change, technological advancement, and the enforcement of regulations, including the Climate Change Act in 2008. The wonderful website, The World in Data, has lots of information on this. This is the UK data. Can you see on the right-hand side, bottom chart, real GDP per head going up, constant prices, recession, recession obviously in 2009. The blue line at the top, that is the million tonnes of CO2 equivalent falling quite substantially below 1990 levels. In terms of the advanced countries, the, the highest per capita greenhouse gas emissions uh, are from Australia. That's uh, substantially uh, Australia, United States, substantially in Canada, substantially above other countries. Where does the UK come in there? We come in at 7.39, below that of Brazil. That's per capita greenhouse emissions. Um, I mean, typically, countries with the highest GDP have the highest levels of CO2 emissions. So China on a PPP basis is the biggest economy in the world. United States is second, India third. And that's reflected actually in the sort of largest producers of territorial fossil fuel CO2 emissions in 2017. So China has 27% of global CO2 emissions. There's a key point here. It's going to take a concerted, coordinated policy action between countries, the major countries, to make a decisive difference in reducing emissions per dollar of GDP. But the good news is, in my opinion, that uh, the global share of renewable sources used in power generation is rising. The curve is moving more steeply in an upward direction. In 2018, the latest figures for which we have 13%, 13% of the world's power production was generated from renewable sources, excluding largely uh, large hydropower sources, so wind, solar, and other forms forces of energy. The brilliant World in Data site, our World in Data, well worth having a look at, tracks this rather interesting chart showing GDP per capita on the x-axis and CO2 emissions per capita on the y. And you can see that if you take a given level of GDP, for example, Sweden, uh, and then go up vertically. Similar levels of GDP per capita can lead to very, very different, widely different CO2 emissions per capita, all the way up to Trinidad and Tobago, UAE, Bahrain, etc. Huge differences that uh, are apparent there. So there we go. Uh, this has been a short video on the environmental cosinus curve. Uh, the acceptance of this curve, if you think this curve exists, that, that suggests that there's an inevitable level of like environmental damage or degradation that, that happens due to economic development, but there is the potential for significant improvement at a later stage of development. Uh, the key is to have the right policies and incentives in place for that to happen.